Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the all-new R58X Mini from Mikotronics. Now, what we have here is a powerful ARM-based device that's capable of running Linux and Android. And recently on the channel, we took a look at the larger model from Mikotronics known as the R58X. But this is coming in a lot smaller, it's going to have a lower price tag, and they have removed support for an NVMe drive, but we can still add a 2.5 inch drive or a SATA drive to this unit. Unfortunately, we don't have NVMe support on the mini version, but we've still got all of the power as the larger version because it's using that same CPU. It's the RK3588, and when it comes to raw performance, this is actually on par with the Snapdragon 855. So all in all, these are the most powerful little ARM-based mini PCs that we've tested on the channel. You can call them Android boxes if you want to, because a lot of them do come pre-installed with Android. But they're also capable of running Linux, like Ubuntu and Debian. This does come with a 12-volt power supply. We've got our SATA adapter, so we can add a 2.5-inch drive. It's got our Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas. Comes with a 2.4 gigahertz remote that does use a dongle over USB. We get an HDMI cable and USB Type-C. If you're not familiar with the Rock Chip 3588, this is a really powerful little chip. And in Android, it can actually emulate PS2 and even GameCube games. So anything underneath that is also good to go. Taking a look at the I.O. on this box, up front here we've got our audio in and audio out ports. So we have two 3.5 millimeter jacks up here full-size USB 3.0, two full-size USB 2.0, and USB Type-C. Over here on the left-hand side, we've got a full-size display port, and we've also got our SATA jack here for the included adapter, so we can add a 2.5-inch drive to this really easily. And around back, we've got a gigabit Ethernet port and three full-size HDMI ports. We've got two outputs and one input. When it comes to this input, you could plug something in there like a console over HDMI, and through the operating system itself, you can switch over to that connection and record the screen if you want to. Taking a look at the internals here, we've got a passively cooled CPU, so a nice little heat sink here, real-time clock battery pre-installed, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0, but unfortunately they did remove that M.2 drive. It does look like they would have had room in here, and it's a little unfortunate, but I know they had to cut costs somewhere. So I've done some testing with the RK3588 on the channel, and this is definitely the most powerful little Android box that I've ever tested. It even beats out the NVIDIA Shield TV when it comes to CPU and GPU performance. With this, we get an octa-core CPU, we've got four A76 cores running at up to 2.4 GHz, and four A55 cores at 1.8. The GPU here is a Mali G610 NP4, and this actually puts down some really good GPU performance. They do sell a couple different storage variants of this, but the one we're taking a look at in this video has 8GB of LPDDR4X RAM paired up with 64GB of eMMC storage. It's all soldered to the board, so it's non-user replaceable. They also offer a 4GB model with 32GB of storage and a model with 16GB of RAM and 64GB of storage. But when it comes down to it, 8 gigs is going to be plenty for this little setup here. And by the way, this little box is capable of doing 8K 60FPS out. All right, so I've just gone ahead and booted everything up. I've signed into my Google Play account, and that's one of the great things about it. It does have Google Play pre-installed, so we don't have to mess with that. The remote itself also works as an air mouse, but you could also navigate the full operating system with a controller, either wired or connected over Bluetooth, or you could plug in a keyboard and mouse if you want to. Now, it might not seem like a lot to some people nowadays, but having access to Google Play right out of the box is a big plus for something like this. A lot of the other 3588 devices that I've tested so far just can't do it yet. And if you're not really into the interface they're using out of the box, you can install a third-party launcher. Here's the Android TV launcher, and this is one that I really like to use on these bigger screen devices. You can actually delete apps from this menu here, so you can show only what you want to show once you boot this thing up. But yeah, I just think it's really easy to navigate this with a controller, and that's one of the big reasons I use it. You can also use LaunchBox for Android if you just want to use this for emulation. And when it comes to emulation performance, I mean, this thing is really great. It does outperform the NVIDIA Shield TV Pro. I mean, I can do PSP up to 5X with a lot of the harder-to-run stuff, and it even does PS2 and GameCube. I'll definitely be testing that out in the video. And from the device preferences, we can change the resolution from 720 up to 4K, and I'm not sure if 8K would be listed here if I had it plugged into an 8K monitor, but we're working at 4K 60 right now. We can also change the HDMI color, which does come in really handy. You don't have to mess with the monitor settings itself. And this also supports over-the-air updates from Mikotronics. 
Right now I'm connected to my Wi-Fi 6 router and I definitely want to test out a little bit of 4K video playback. So we'll head over here to YouTube. I've just got a little demo video here. We'll make sure that we're at 4K and I'll turn stats for nerds on. But yeah, I've done some testing with this 3588 and 4K video playback. It handles it really well, whether you want to stream it or play from internal or external storage. So on the initial load in right there, we just got nine drop frames and that's kind of normal once you're loading in. If I was on ethernet or I just let the video buffer for about three seconds before I hit play, we wouldn't see those kind of drop frames and throughout it's going to be steady. We won't see any more drop frames through this whole video. And this happens on about 90% of the devices that I test on that initial load in. We always get a couple drop frames, but as soon as it's buffered up, we're good to go. So the next thing I wanted to take a look at were some benchmarks, and I know they're synthetic, but I always still like running them. They're really impressive, especially when it comes to the GPU performance out of this RK3588. So first up, we've got Geekbench 5, single core, 536, multi, 2306. On the Shield TV Pro, we get around a 282 on single and a 972 on multi. So we're beating that on single and multi. And when it comes to GPU performance, Using 3D Mark Wildlife, which is a Vulcan benchmark, we scored a 4,054. The Shield Pro is around 3,100 with this one. And the final benchmark here was an 22. We got a 562,156. Never been able to run this new version of an 22 with the Nvidia Shield, but I'm sure it's going to be much lower. But one thing we can compare this to is the Snapdragon 855 in something like the Galaxy S10 Plus. Total score on that is around 484,000. And for the individual benchmark, CPU, GPU, memory, and UX, this is beating out the Snapdragon 855 in all of those tests, and that's really impressive for a rock chip SoC. Now it's time to move over to a little bit of native Android gaming, and first up we've got Dead Cells. Not a super hard game to run, but this is a PC port over to Android, and it runs perfectly fine on this device, I figured it would. I actually haven't run into a native Android game that doesn't work really well on this device. Even something like Genshin Impact at low settings will run at 60 FPS on this thing. Unfortunately, the developers for that still haven't added native controller support for Android, but there are a lot of games on Google Play that have controller support right out of the box, and this thing's going to handle them. But one of the most impressive things about this little setup here is the emulation performance. So here we have some PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP, Tekken 6, Vulcan Backend, 5X resolution. As you can see, the clarity on this is really great for a PSP game, and we could probably take it up a bit higher with this one. And of course, the easier to emulate stuff will be able to go up even to 10X. But when it comes to something like Chains of Olympus, 3X is kind of the max there with that Vulcan back end, but it still looks great. So PSP works very, very well on the RK3588. So does Dreamcast, Sega Saturn, N64. I mean, the lower end stuff is going to work just fine. But what I wanted to show off was a little bit of GameCube using the Dolphin emulator. This is the standalone development version of Dolphin from their official website. And the main thing that got me good performance out of this is taking the device's resolution down to 720p and running this at its native resolution. So we've got the Vulcan back in here. This game's running really well. And this is one that's always given me issues on Android, even on something like the Snapdragon 865, always a lot of choppiness. And with this, we're running at a steady 60. But one of the most impressive things about this is the PS2 emulation using Ether SX2. And a lot of it does come down to the awesome emulator itself. I mean, this is a very great emulator. It's still a bit early, but we've been getting amazing performance on a lot of different devices. I'm using the OpenGL back in right now at 3x resolution. And with some of this stuff, you might have to swap between OpenGL and Vulkan. But here's another one, OpenGL 3x full speed. Got all of my stats up there in the top right hand corner. But it doesn't mean that every single game is going to run at full speed without some hacks on. So something like God of War 2 was one of those games I did have to take it down to 1x, and I also put a little bit of frame skip on it, so we're not quite at 60, but it did smooth it up quite a bit. With no frame skip, it averages around 54 FPS, but it feels a little choppy like that, but as soon as I put that frame skip on, it does make it a very playable experience. So obviously, when it comes to Android performance on this, it's a really powerful little unit. Now I will have a video coming up with Linux. They did release a Debian build, 
but 3D acceleration has been having an issue with that build, so as soon as that's fixed, I will make a full video on that. But overall, it's a great performer, and I really wish they would have left that M.2 slot on the mini version, but they did have to save a little bit of money somewhere. We've always got that 2.5 inch drive and the internal storage, plus we can add a USB drive anytime we want, so we still have a couple storage options when it comes to the Mini. But if you're interested in learning more about this thing, I will leave a link to Mikotronics in the description. They offer the Mini and the full size version. If it was up to me, the full size version is the one I would choose just because we've got that NVMe support. And when it comes down to it, it's not much bigger than the Mini, but keep in mind, you will get the same performance out of both of them given that you choose the same amount of RAM with each of these units. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If there's anything else you want to see running in an Android, just let me know in the comments below and I can get another video made. But yeah, I'm really excited about Linux. And as soon as I get my hands on a really nice build of Linux for this, I will make a couple videos. So if that's something you're interested in seeing, it'd be pretty cool if you could hit that subscribe button and maybe turn notifications on so you know when I post the next one. If you have any questions, let me know down below. And like always, thanks for watching.